the councillors had fed the people. Dr. Lynn had fed the people. And so had all these ladies. And although they were wealthy people, with plenty of money and could have said the lasers which is they didn't they threw their ways in behind this scum of the air so to speak the dublin strike was broken and the workers returned without gains but larkins and connolly's union was not broken as the employers had hoped it would be the event had so dominated attention in the south that the parliamentary nationalist john dillon could write in the autumn of 1913 that the Ulster question appeared dim and distant and of minor importance. Partly Dillon and other Irish nationalists could think like this because here at Westminster a Liberal government had by now introduced a new third Home Rule Bill and Irish nationalists were rather letting themselves take Home Rule for granted and assuming that Ulster opposition was mere bluff they could do this because of what had been happening here on the parliamentary scene. In 1910, two general elections gave almost identical results. Liberals and Conservatives equally balanced, with 82 Irish nationalists holding the balance. The Parliament, opened in 1911 by King George V and Queen Mary, had been a revolutionary one, changing the course of both Irish and English history. In that parliament, in return for the Irish party's 82 strong support, the Prime Minister Asquith agreed to introduce this third Home Rule Bill. And with that Irish support, Asquith first abolished the veto of the House of Lords. He did this by threatening to create new Liberal peers to swamp the House of Lords if the Lords themselves didn't accept their loss of power. It was this removal of the power of the House of Lords that made this third Home Rule Bill quite different from the other two. This time Home Rule seemed bound to go through and it was this that set alarm bells ringing in the north of Ireland in Protestant Ulster. Now of course here in the north alarm bells had rung before at the time of the first two Home Rule Bills. And then there had been a good deal of bluff involved because everyone knew that the House of Lords would reject the bills anyway. Now, though, things were quite different. Now, with the Liberal and Irish majority secure in the House of Commons and the power of the House of Lords removed, Home Rule seemed bound to go through. Now, for Ulster Protestants, the danger of being overwhelmed in a Catholic Dublin Parliament seemed at their door, just as the Catholic rebels had been at their door in the Great Rebellion of 1641, or the Catholic armies of King James II had been at the gates of Derry in 1689. And as Ulster Protestants had said before, and were saying now again, but with a greater purpose and determination than they'd ever shown before, they would not have home rule. For some time now, Orangemen in the north had been parading and drilling, as they were legally entitled to do, to maintain the constitution of the United Kingdom as now established. And for the implacable stand they were now taking, they had found a great leader, a Dublin Unionist lawyer and powerful orator, Edward Carson, who now swore to Ulster Protestants that he would help them put down what he called the most nefarious conspiracy that has yet been hatched against a free people. And he carried them enthusiastically with him as he threatened that they would go beyond the law and take over the government of Ulster themselves. You seem to have that uh, power of uh, delivery that he infused people with the will to resist. He was a great leader and he had a great power of a voice. That's what I remember most as a child this very, very powerful voice and very emotional. He used to kind of end the speech with, Ulster is written on my heart and everybody was quite sobby about it, yeah. And Carson carried not only the Protestants of Ulster with him, but the British Conservative Party. Its leader, Bona Law, came to Belfast and was made welcome because he'd come to offer Ulster Protestants 
the Conservative opposition's wholehearted and unequivocal support in whatever they might do to resist home rule. In England, in the summer of 1912, a great Conservative and Unionist meeting had been held at the Duke of Marlborough's house at Blenheim. At this meeting, Bonalore, Law, the Conservative leader, said he could imagine no lengths of resistance to which Ulster could go in which he would not be prepared to support them. In Ulster, with the backing of the Conservatives and, as he believed, the majority of the British people behind him, Carson was now as confident as he was determined. The slogan of 20 years before was now for real. Ulster would fight, and Ulster, he insisted, would be right. On the 28th of September, 1912, Carson and his lieutenant, James Craig, staged a vast and remarkable demonstration at the City Hall in Belfast. A demonstration of their determination to set up a provisional government in Ulster the morning Home Rule passed. Hundreds of thousands of Ulster Protestants came to the City Hall to sign a solemn League and Covenant to resist Home Rule. Escorted by a guard of honour of 2,500 in bowler hats and carrying walking sticks, Carson himself arrived to be the first to sign. signed with a special silver pen. He was followed by more than 200,000 men, come solemnly to pledge themselves to apply all means necessary to defeat the present conspiracy to set up a Home Rule Parliament in Ireland, and to reject its authority if it were set up. Some of the boys were so enthusiastic that they cut that, uh, uh, their arm and got a bit of the blood out of their arm and signed it with their blood. So that's the sort of man was fighting for us there. It was several days before all those wishing to had signed the covenant, order being kept by marshals of the Ulstermen themselves. Those Ulstermen who'd been drilling had for some time been calling themselves Ulster Volunteers. But they were hardly yet a military force. They were then drilling with uh, wooden, wooden guns, you see. And it was just the, the ordinary discipline of drills, marching and counter-marching and things like that. It was more, as see, like a home guard idea. I mean, they had nothing to defend themselves with, really. I mean, they had wooden rifles and hats stuck up at one side with a badge on them. But if Ulster was really going to fight, it would soon need something more than wooden rifles. Carson came to watch a great parade at Balmoral near Belfast in 1913. We all formed up and we walked to Balmoral where the speeches was made and where a large flag pool was put up and he unfurled the flag, this is, was the biggest Union Jack ever was made and there was hundreds and hundreds of Union Jack. Carson watched a hundred thousand well-drilled and disciplined men known now as the Ulster Volunteer Force march past him, led by, on horseback, a retired Indian Army General, Sir George Richardson. important step was to get arms. Arms for men who'd now been drilling for well over a year. When they were getting very serious, we all formed up in battalions in the different parts of the country. 